Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. May I have your attention, please? Yep. Thank you so much again. Um, thank you for the discussion that we've had this morning and all the insight that have been provided by different speakers, panelists, uh, but also by the director uh, this morning. So this is the second part of the, of the summit. We'll have a panel now, then we'll have also the last fireside chat, which will be on alumni. But now I have the pleasure to call to the stage all of the panelists for the um, Arts Society and Development Panel. This one I know a lot of people will be looking forward to. Um, and we're very happy also to have such a diverse group of uh, people come from different industries and then doing different works in the field of what we call the forgotten industry in general, so arts, music. Uh, so please, uh, Mona Lee, I would like you to come on stage and also have all the speakers as well to be on stage. Thanks so much. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, again, good afternoon. We're the fun panel. At least that's what we hope to have you engage for the next hour and 30 minutes. So thank you for joining us. Um, our panel is Arts Allure, Redefining Narratives and Landscapes. And we're joined by our four trailblazing panelists. Um, first, we have Bansoa Sigam. That's the female, she's saying hi. She's a cultural scientist and a curator. She specialized in Western and Central African heritage. We also have Fode Dumbuya, or menswear designer, founder, and creative director of his brand, Labroom London. And we're also joined by Obu Bey, who is an artist, and he's known for painting the emblematic Dan mask and he also wears it. Today, he didn't really give us a, a peak view of that, but that's his normal um, trademark signature style. We're also going to be joined by Joseph Kaifala. Hopefully, he'll be joining us online. He's a Sierra Leonean human rights activist, lawyer, writer, and historian. Um, so again, thank you. We're pleased to have you um, at this, the debut summit on Africa at the Graduate Institute. Um, do I need to give you? the opportunity to do the translation, Sarah? Yeah. It's good. OK, perfect, right. So um, I'm going to start with you, Obu. And I'm going to start with you because your art, it cuts across so many spaces. It cut, cuts across um, painting, music, performances. So I really want us to tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us what's your drive, what's your inspiration. Really tell us who you are at your core and what makes you the artist that you are. Thank you. Yes, you may begin, please. Um, you could do it from there if you wanted to come here. But uh, okay. Bonjour à tous et merci pour cette opportunité. Je suis au Bougbe, comme elle a dit tout à l'heure. Je suis un artiste contemporain ivoirien. Donc je viens de la Côte d'Ivoire. Et mon travail, il parle de la condition humaine, donc euh, de mon environnement, de tout ce qui m'entoure. Et dans mon travail, je, je me suis réapproprié le masque d'âne, que j'ai toujours avec moi, bien sûr, que je porte, que je peins et je raconte des histoires nouvelles à travers ce masque. J'essaie je, de lui donner la place qu'il mérite et je, je fais beaucoup de projets avec ce masque. Et donc, euh, c'est vraiment ça, la petite, euh, la petite définition du peintre au bout. Et, ouais. Thank you so much. Um, and then, Fode, I want to ask you, because increasingly, fashion is becoming so much more than style. And as a menswear designer, creative director, I want you to tell us who you are and what is the inspiration behind your brand. So this is a brief introduction, and then afterwards we'll each give you the opportunity. We'll give you the opportunity each to talk some more about your work. Amazing. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, my name is Fode Dumbuya. Um, I'm from Sierra Leone, um, and I grew up in London. 
I'm a menswear designer by trade um, and also the creative director of Labroom London. So just a brief, um, the inspiration behind the brand is to tell um, a West African story to bridge a gap between the West and um, West Africa. And also I feel like um, African fashion wasn't portrayed the right way that I know it growing up between those two worlds. So I thought, why not do something that tells a real story about West African fashion um, that I know and also music and art. So I set up the brand to tell those stories um, using illustrations um, and also developing textiles. So every story is illustrated on textiles and then we do a show in London and then all around Paris and then around the world. So yeah, it's more breaking the, that stigma of what African fashion is, that's why I set up the brand. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And we'll certainly hear more from both you and Obu as we progress. Um, ben Sowa, you know, there's a curiosity about you because you describe yourself as a polymath. And I think we would all like to know why would somebody like yourself, a polymath, choose art as a medium to express yourself and for academic investigation? So tell us a little bit more about yourself and why this path, please. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you for this question and for the organization um, of this summit. I'm so grateful to have been invited to take part uh, in the summit and to be in the panel with such uh, impactful creatives. And I really admire and appreciate both of your work. Um, so yeah, about me, when I say polymath is because I have so many different interests and um, my work and practice is at the intersection of many different uh, academic disciplines and also different fields. So as you can see, as you could see, <laughs> my PhD is in uh, cultural geography and art history, and it's an interdisciplinary uh, thesis around um, women and heritage, African cultural heritage, but I also am a founder of a um, cultural agency and consultancy around African arts and culture. And I um, really like to uh, bridge communities, build with communities, and be part of communities. So I also am part of a team uh, here in this uh, civil society where we've, uh, we've try to promote um, uh, artists of African descent through exhibitions and through um, magazines. And finally, I've been uh, elected also um, as president of the Cultural Commission uh, in my municipality. So I try to be engaged um, politically. I'm no longer uh, there because I couldn't do so much, but uh, uh, yeah, I do different things on different uh, spectrum. Thank you. And online, we're joined by Joseph uh, Kaifala, who is the human rights activist based in Sierra Leone. Now, Joseph, um, looking at your blog, I see that you were constantly concerned about this loss of, you know, sites of memory that relates to this Sierra Leonean civil war. And I would like to ask you just to introduce yourself and to briefly say why this issue is important. Why does it matter? Thank you. Hello, everyone. And uh, thanks for inviting me. I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, I'm new to this this WebEx stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a lawyer, historian, and a writer. A um, um, few years ago, I went into memory and remembrance work uh, because um, those of you who are adults in the room or a bit older will remember the violence of the Sierra Leoneans war. Uh, but that civil war ended in a way that was not really organized. Um, in fact, if we hadn't set up the Truth and Reconciliation, the, the, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, it would have um, uh, been a whole 
mess of impunity. So uh, this is exactly why I decided to get into memory and remembrance work because um, uh, Wallace Inca said that um, if we do not confront history, we are prone to its conditioning. And uh, I think at the end of the Sierra Leonean Civil War, we have not been able to deal with the past, the consequences of that conflict as it's reflected uh, on human lives. And, and this is what was captivating to me. Uh, we all were told to forgive and forget and go home. And even as a college student, I kept wondering, how does one forget that you got raped, you got your hands cut up? or you were a child soldier who had killed hundreds and hundreds of people uh, to just simply go home without any form of rehabilitation or conversation about the consequences and effects of that conflict. So now, after college, I came back to Sierra Leone to, to deal with these issues. And that is when I set up the Center for Memory and Reparations. We do two primary works. We go around the country looking for the mass graves that were left by the conflict and also offer the people a chance to do their traditional burial rites. In Sierra Leone, we believe that when people died, there should be a traditional burial rites, whether by Christian or Islamic religion, to give them a fitting burial. We were not able to do that when we are all on the run for our lives. So I'm granting communities the opportunity to do that and to protect these mass graves as sites of conscience for remembrance and memory. And then secondly, we are ensuring that the younger generation of Sierra Leoneans understand the issues that left, led us into that conflict by teaching them the history of the conflict itself. So we go back to schools and talk to students about the conflict. The idea is not to dwell on the past in and of itself, but to help us transcend the issues that led us into that violent conflict. In essence, our work is to use memory to build peace. Thank you, thank you. So members of the audience, I, I'm sensing that you are formulating your questions. You've seen the scope of expertise that we have here. So I just want to encourage you, don't ever be shy. Keep thinking about your questions, write them down and we'll certainly have you engaged. Um, I should also introduce myself very briefly. My name is Mona Lee Gibbs. I'm a former student at the Graduate Institute and, and I'm from Jamaica. Now, art, as you can see, it's, it's alluring. We're all drawn to the, the visual, the sensory stimulation from art, but having heard from our panelists, we know that art serves a larger, a more critical role in, in so far as you know, society and development goes. So I'm gonna go back to our panelists and ask them to really connect their work, their art, with society and development and point us precisely to the intersection or to the point where we can see the impact that art plays in development and in society. So I will start with uh, Bansoa. And you mentioned that you are doing your research work on what you, you've coined African cultural heritage. Of course, that's a very interesting perspective. And if we think about it, you know, African societies, perhaps ancient African societies were perhaps um, very matriarchal. And it seems like perhaps mainstream or more contemporary African, African art um, is perhaps more patriarchal. So I don't know if it's that your work, if you, through your work you're seeking to kind of reestablish this legitimacy. So I just ask you to speak to that a little bit and also then what do you see as a future for your, your new innovation, which is heritage? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, so my thesis uh, is around museum collections. I have a background as a museum professional, uh, mostly working uh, in uh, exhibition curation and in ethnographic context. So as a, I'm a trained anthropologist and um, museum uh, museologist. And uh, after that, I've worked uh, several years in uh, the context of uh, ethnographic museums. But uh, my presentation that I'll do a bit later will let you know a bit more about 
how I came to this. And uh, it's a lot linked with my uh, parents and uh, m their path as African immigrants in Europe. Um, and so what I've noticed working uh, within the context of ethnographic museums and with collections, um, and the term is uh, very much uh, literally used in a sense that it, it really masks a lot of what it really means uh, as uh, these, these I, I call it um, total art or systemic art is uh, in the museum, but this is the current debate in the museum and so my thesis is in a perspective of uh, critical and decolonial museology. And uh, what I've noticed working in the museum is that there's a constant invisibility of women uh, that were either, um, yeah, in the entangled uh, ecosystems of uh, collecting in Africa. And so we don't see names, we don't see, and this is what I'm now researching, seeing whether there are people, what were the actual uh, gender dynamics and uh, what the translocation can tell us about the, the history of women that has been uh, invisibilized. Okay, thank you. Do you mind going further into your presentation at this point? Your main presentation, that's fine. Okay, great. I'll, uh, I'll just go. I, I wrote it down so, so I tell you everything that I need to tell you <laughs> today that I wanted to tell you. Because um, I'm academic, so I had a PowerPoint and everything <laughs> clear. <laughs> and then it was, oh, no, no PowerPoint. So, I'll just go with uh, reading this story about storytelling about my, uh, my path. So uh, I'm gonna start by using this platform to honor my father. Not just because I'm a daddy's girl, but um, because he honored me. And I will show you how in this um, presentation. So, at home, we would always share stories by uh, the, the fireplace um, around how, when my dad went to school in colonial Cameroon in the 50s, they were taught that his ancestors were the Gauls. So the Gauls are the former French people. Uh, imagine how he felt when he arrived in France in the 60s as a young scholarship holder to study medicine with a group of uh, a fellow, um, yeah, of fellow students. And he had no idea how foreign he would end up feeling in the land of his supposed ancestors and how distraught he'd be about the pretended history-less Africa. He was a true stranger in the village as James Baldwin describes his uh, literary residency in, um, in Lukabad in Valais in 1951. But this is not a story of sorrow, of course. Uh, it's a story of resilience, of belonging, of self-empowerment, and of art as an empowerment tool for this young African whose extraordinary story led him to migrate to a new country and who started to engage with African art to better understand African history. My story begins when uh, he and my mom combined their vision and DNA and passions and found a new place to call home in the outskirts of Geneva, and this is where I grew up, uh, with lots of siblings and an extended family and um, and soon a lot of connections within this community. Uh, but you can imagine that in a little Swiss village 
we were the strangers in the village. <laughs> Soon, however, uh, as our, our, our family, as we grew up, I went to primary school in the early 90s, and we were obviously the only African kids, and you know how kids find anything to tease you about, and we as kids find anything to tease other people about, but um, for me it was the name. So I resented my parents so much for not calling me like Stephanie or like an easy name, something I thought that would, uh, you know, hide a bit of my otherness. So, um, when I stopped, but they had chosen Mansoa, as you saw. And it took years and years for me to accept this name and to own it. It is when I stopped thinking of my name as a, just a marker of my otherness that I digged, digged into its meaning that I better understood that my name was in fact my power and my uniqueness. Mansoa means magic. It's the name of a people, of a culture, of a language uh, in Cameroon, when, where I'm originally from. And people there are always surprised when they hear my name. They say, your parents really love their land. And they were right. Uh, my dad wanted to write his memoirs using this pseudonym, but he unfortunately uh, never had the time to write it. So I told you my story to show you that in this path of self-discovery and reappropriation, which is a lifelong journey, of course, I found my strength and my power. And so I'm convinced that the reappropriation of knowledge of the underlying meanings of African art that have been lost in translation through colonization and uh, translocations, uh, they're such a potent empowerment tools for Africans on and outside of the continent. What can be called total art should be understood beyond is evident aesthetic value uh, but also as history, as philosophy, as ecosystem, as paradigms, paradigms. And this systemic art is a way to rethink our relationship to the environment, our relationship to ourselves, and our relationship to each other. Um, it also helps to create new landscapes, new continuities and discontinuities for optimal, not just development, I know some of you don't like this word, I heard this earlier, but for fulfillment. That is why I've dedicated my life path and career to promoting this sense of empowerment for people and institutions through curating, researching, and sharing. I don't take these three words lightly. Um, I understand curating in its etymological sense. So in Latin, curare means to care for, to tend to. I understand researching in both the academic sense and the holistic perspective, researching within and without. And I understand sharing in the Ubuntu sense. I am because you are, so we share our com common humanity. So that is how the young cultural agency and consultancy NOLA that I told you about earlier, uh, that I created, uh, it means tradition and transmission, and we have now offered more than 40 workshops around African arts, uh, worked with two galleries, including <laughs> Philafrique, uh, where Pantrebou um, has an exhibition tonight, I think, and close to 100 children has developed a line of products and will launch its new workshop and masterclass series on African writing systems to keep increasing African art literacy. So I will end with two calls for action. First, if you're interested in learning more about NOLA, the masterclass, and uh, come share your email with me. 
And second, honor your daughters and give them difficult names. <laughs> Thank you, um, Bansoa. That's a very good point, a very good note in which to end um, your presentation. The, the thing about names and identity, I think it's so poignant. It's, it's, it's an ever-present issue that's with you. I wanted to be sure I was pronouncing all of your, all of your names correctly, and you know, I came to you before and it's like, be sure, repeat for me, please, I need to get it correct. But you were also very, you had this awareness that, um, you know, different accents, um, different intonations. And the important thing I got from that is that if you know who you are and what your name is, if somebody else says it in a, in a way that you are not used to, it really doesn't matter because you have the sense of identity within you already and you know who you are. So I think that's a good point to end, on, to end your presentation on. Okay, so I will go across now to Obu. Um, I think we, we all want to see and to hear some more about the Dan mask. Um, you, your work focuses on human conditions and their cultural identity. So if you could tell us a little bit more, please, about the different worlds that you try to connect through, through the, the work that you do, the urban life and the traditional foundations, and specifically, what is this, what specific human conditions are you interested in or drawn to, and why is this relevant? Why or how is this relevant for cultural identity and portrayed through the work that you do? Thank you. Okay. Alors, je, je dirais que mon avenue dans, dans l'art, c'est c'est vraiment toute une histoire parce que tu veux traduire au fur et à mesure. Ok. Parce que j'ai mon avenue dans l'art était c'est toute une histoire. My journey with art is a long story. J'ai j'ai grandi à l'ouest de la Côte d'Ivoire, là où, où il y a eu la crise 2002, c'était vraiment grave là-bas. I grew up in the west of Ivory Coast where there was a very hard crisis in 2002. Et depuis l'enfant, je dessinais comme tous les enfants, j'avais le rêve d'être un dessinateur, mais pas un artiste. When I was a child, I was drawing as all the children, but my dream was to be um, an artist and not a, just a drawer. Et après cette crise, uh, on s'est rendu à, à Abidjan, la capitale. After this crisis, we went to Abidjan, the capital of Ivory Coast. Et c'est là-bas que j'ai vraiment voulu oublier tout, toutes ces, ces scènes traumatiques que j'ai vues pendant la crise. That's where I really wanted to forget about all these traumatic scenes that I've witnessed during this crisis. Donc c est, c est le point qui a amené à so that was the maybe yeah. starting point that brought me to art. And then so when I went to art school, it was easy for me to, to find a subject working on traumatized people from these crises. Et à chaque fois que je dessinais des personnages déformés, défigurés, qui avaient peur, il y a certains professeurs qui me disaient, ton travail ressemble à Picasso. Yeah. Many of the work I was doing is compared to the work of Picasso because of the faces I was painting and they were... Um, Mm -hmm. et, et donc du coup, je suis allé voir c'est qui Picasso. J'étais jeune encore vraiment. So I had to go and see who is Picasso because I was obviously quite young. Et j'ai vu que ce, ce qui a fait le succès de ce monsieur, c'est un masque d'âne de ma région. And I discovered that uh, the success behind Picasso yeah. is actually this mask, the mask d'âne from my region. Et donc du, du coup, depuis depuis lors, je je me suis rendu compte que J'avais déjà un héritage au fait sur lequel travailler le masque et je me suis jeté vraiment dedans à travailler directement sur le masque. So I came to the conclusion that, that I did have a heritage that I could start building my work on, which was this mask. Et du coup, je me suis je me suis réapproprié ce masque que je porte aujourd'hui. 
and I tried to reappropriate this mask, which I'm working on and with now. Et je l'utilise pour raconter mes histoires propres à moi-même et aussi les histoires de ceux qui m'entourent du monde entier. And I use it to tell stories about myself, about my surroundings, but about also the world. Mais après, le but de, de tout ça, c'est venu après mon arrivée en Occident pour la première fois. Le but de, de ce travail, c'est tout. Ça dit... Ouais. Tu veux que j'explique je, So the objective of my work actually, uh, il est venu donc uh, c'est ça. Après mon mon atterrissage en Occident, voir un peu dans des musées en Occident surtout. Ouais. So when I came to the Western world, je me suis rendu compte que il y avait tellement de masques dans des musées ici qui étaient souvent dans des sous-sols qui ne vivaient pas. I've seen that there are a lot of masks in many museums, and most of these masks were actually in basements, and they were not. Brought to life. Et donc, du coup, cela a renforcé encore mon envie de travailler sur ce masque, de lui donner la valeur et de, de partager ça avec les, les Africains et les Ivoiriens surtout. And that had pushed me actually to, to give importance to this mask, work on it and bring it to the outside world. Et mon but, c'est vraiment de réconcilier les gens avec le masque parce qu'aujourd'hui, les gens n'ont plus... Euh, cette considération pour le masque, euh, ils n'ont plus l'idée de, de la richesse qu'a qu le masque aujourd'hui. So today my, my work is actually to reconcile people with this mask and uh, bring back the value that this mask has. Et donc du coup, j'utilise le masque pour raconter les scènes de la vie quotidienne, les scènes de ma ville, les scènes d'Abidjan, les scènes des gens que je connais. Donc c'est comme si on se ressentait dans le travail. C'est comme si on portait le masque pour le monde, on était fier d'avoir ce masque. Ok, première fois en deux fois. So, um, through this mask, I tried to tell the stories of the people in Abidjan, the everyday life. Et, et, et donc, du coup, je, je, je mets le masque en scène chaque fois. And I put this mask on, on stage. Et le but, c'est de vraiment... <coughs> de vraiment faire accepter cette culture afin que tout le monde se mette ensemble pour aborder la question de restitution. And through this mask, I tried to, to bring everyone together so that we could um, talk and discuss about the issue of restitution. Yeah. Et je me suis dit que avant d'aborder cette question, si nous-mêmes on n'est pas conscient de, de l'importance de, de ces objets, de ce masque, si on ne les aime pas, si on les, on les dénigre, on les rejette, on ne peut pas aborder cette question-là. Et ouais. And we cannot answer or try to explore this question if we ourselves don't uh, give the importance that this mask ha has. Et donc depuis là, c'est devenu ma nouvelle mission. J'ai décidé de porter le masque, de parler du masque d'Anne, qui est, qui est toute ma culture. Donc je suis en un mot, le représentant de ma culture, parce que quand je porte ce masque, au bout, ben, n'existe plus, mais c'est vraiment toute la culture d'Anne qui est représentée à travers ce masque. And when I wear this mask, uh, part of my identity is, um, or actually, this mask itself speaks about this identity beyond myself, a broader identity. Et à la fin de mon discours, je dirais merci. Et merci d'abord à ma mère qui, qui a insisté qu'on me donne le nom de son père qui s'appelait Obu. Et je pense que ce nom a, a vraiment agi sur moi aujourd'hui dans, dans tout ce que j'entreprends parce que Obu en français c'est quelqu'un qui va jusqu'au bout, qui, qui, est, qui est toujours focus. Et donc ce, ce nom-là a vraiment agi sur moi et je l'ai aujourd'hui comme signature. Je suis Obu et merci. Merci à vous. Um, it highlights to us the, you know, there is a common theme throughout about reappropriation and identities. And with that, I would like to go to Fode and to ask you to speak about the reappropriation that I think your work is speaking to as far as African fashion goes and the need to push a, a counter narrative which you call black joy. So if you could tell us a little bit more about that and tell us some more about your work, please. Mm. Uh. 
Thanks again. Um, the thing about my work is, is I'm trying to change the narrative of how people see immigrants, how people see African, how people see African fashion, African design, African textiles. Because when I was growing up in London, um, it was difficult to say you're from Africa because people look at us as like the lowest denominator of like people in terms of category. So they think you primitive, you, you way behind in terms of cultural. So growing up in London, that frustrates me a lot because from the stories I hear from my parents, because um, I, I moved to London when I was four years old, so it, I, I couldn't connect much with it, so it's just learning from my parents. So, but from those stories, I know it was, it was joyful and it was beautiful when it comes to music. They tell me about creation of music and it, they, talk, they talk to me about all the musicians, like people like Kanda Bongoman, like Fela Kuti, all these guys, and then they tell me about high life, um, a genre which is a music genre that goes way back in 1920s. But when you're in this, in this environment where people think that doesn't mean anything, it doesn't make sense. So I think that's one of the, the things that push me to kind of bring what I know as African being this beautiful, an amazing place that tell beautiful stories that have all this, this cultural reference. So that pushes me. But I, I quickly realized that I need a knowledge um, um, to, to tell those stories. So when I went to university, um, I did a bit of research myself while studying and I finished my degree, came back to London and I was lucky to work for Nike for six years and I realized how amazing storytelling is and how you can change a perspective of other people or how they look at a generation. So I, I pitched a couple of ideas to Nike about telling West African stories, about music in particular. I, I started pitching ideas about high life music, which I know kind of um, Afrobeats derive from high life, and, and because Afrobeats was starting to pick momentum, people don't realize where that originated from. So for me, because I listen to a lot of so songs from my parents at home, the music that they listen to, so I knew there was something before Afrobeat. So I pitched an idea to them to bring that to life through creating textiles um, to put on trainers because the music has this circular form which it goes like up and down, which create waves. So I wanted to create fabrication that can, we can use to create those waves and put onto some of the Air Force Ones. Um, it was difficult because they didn't understand what I was talking about. So my, my boss immediately said to me, we can't do that because it's not our story. With Nike, we don't create stories that derive from Africa because Nike is not African. So it was painful to hear that, um, but also I think that was the thing that gave me the push to set up something which I felt that I can control and I can control the narrative. And why I went and set up the brand called Labron and, and I said, I'm gonna push African narratives, I'm gonna create stories that are not in the public domain because when I grew up in London, some stories that my parents taught me on or what I, le I learned from other people by being within other African or going to like after schools that taught us about Southern African history, it was nowhere to be seen. So which means I missed out of some information as a kid, which means other people or a younger generation would be missing out on those those um, knowledge as well. So I'm banking, making sure the collection always have a, a story about West Africa that ties him back to London because I, was grew, I, I grew up in London. Um, and so when I left Nike, fast forward, I started creating the stories. Again, no one wants to talk about Africa's this place. So it wasn't a thing like where we all enjoy now. You go to certain clubs, you're like, wait, 
are they playing Afrobeat? What have I missed? Because when I was coming here, Afrobeat wasn't a thing that they can play in this club. But all of a sudden, you go to fashion shows, the whole thing is referenced in Africa. So you're like, okay, so we're here now. So, but let's don't forget what is now trending. There's something that actually inspired and influenced that. Can we go back to the stories so that people can understand? Because I feel like if you don't know where you're going, you need to know where you're coming from for you to understand where you're going. So I started pushing narratives, like developing stories from like High Life Music, when it was started, so I talk about High Life Revival. I do a collection, London Fashion Week. No one used to know who I was. Um, telling the stories, people just didn't get it. Um, journalists don't write about it because they don't understand it. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna carry on. I'm gonna use other people that tells this story, that understands it, that wants to talk about it. So I, I link up with, a, with um, um, a magazine called Natal Media and I invited them to one of my shows, which was High Life Revival. So I, I got them into the show before we started, just so that they can see the rehearsal, to understand where the story's from, and I gave them all the, the research that I've done before the show, how we're gonna narrate it. So the, the, the editor quickly just, just put me aside, he says, look, this is a missing piece that we don't have in our publication and no one give us an insight into how to develop collection from start to finish. So she took up on that and took so many pictures and then after that show, and she wrote a huge article about it. So that changes the perspective of how people look at our shows and everybody's starting to be interested to, to understand what story is he telling now. So for us, I'm gonna go back to the story of Nike. Three years after I left Nike and I've gone on my own, they supported me to tell the stories that I wanted to tell. They then went back to Nigeria and did the homecoming thing with Skepta. So now we're here. I was like, I pitched this idea three years ago. Is it because I was in Skepta or because I was one of yours, you don't think it was big enough to tell a West African story? So now they're like, oh, we didn't understand it. We wanted to learn. I said, I would have been the first to teach you how to well, help you understand the story and then we can build from there. But now you're running it through Skepta, but you want me to consult so that the story becomes a Nike story. So I, if you guys get where I'm coming from, so they had to make it a Nike story rather than anchor it on somebody else. So I realized that I couldn't do that because it will kill the idea of why I set up the brand is to tell this West African story and London with no barriers. And so why I stuck to my guns that I would continue doing the stuff that I'm doing with Labrum, telling a West African story, the narrative, the black joy, um, the educating kids that wanted to know more about the culture and also helping other young designers that want to tell a West African story or black story or Caribbean story that don't feel it's, they can do it, but giving them that platform and so why I've started, I employ younger um, designers that are wanting to go through that path and then kind of nurture them to do something for themselves. So I give them life project because when I went on a placement, I wasn't allowed to design anything properly, I just work with designers. So I wanted to change that perspective. Every, everyone that I take on board to work with, with a brand, I give them life projects so that they can have the confidence to, even when they leave lab room, they can go to another brand and have the confidence to walk in and do something. So that's what the brand's been doing. So we're just challenging narrative, we're telling um, and stories just to, just to break the barrier between the West and West African culture, and then educating people about African fabrics. Like, it's this, not, not disrespect to Dutch wax or whatever it is, but for me, I don't think that's us. He's, he specifically said Dutch wax for a reason. Um, he doesn't say African design. So when he got imposed on us, like we carry that all the time and then, when you, when you said you're African designers, people automatically just 
box you into Dutch wax and ask you, what do you make? Dutch wax, this is the, these are the reference. So I'm trying to break that barrier. Why are they not talking about the Bogolan cloth, the Malian cloth? This is, this is mud cloth. This is something that African develop and design themselves. Why are we, are we allow yourself to be boxed up? So that's why I said to every um, designers that come through my, my lenses, I try to educate them about the level of fabrication, about African history and African cloth. So if I'm sitting here today, um, it's because of these guys um, hitting me up and telling me what they're trying to do and what they're doing with this summit. So that's why I said I need to be part of it, to come here and talk a little bit about my story. Um, we can, I can sit here and talk as, for as long as I can, but I think I'm going to let everything flow. I'll be around. We can have a like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. We can talk about my upbringing, my collection, what I do, what I do. So I'm going to probably for the benefit of us flowing this conversation, <laughs> then I'll just, I'll just end it on that note. Yeah, I tell stories on textiles, um, illustrations. I started to do public art. It's just a showcase about these two worlds that I live in, London and, and Sierra Leone. And I believe that can probably benefit other people if you're thinking of doing something that you don't think is cool enough. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Fude. Um, and then I will ask uh, Joseph now to, continuing with the same theme of reappropriation and identity, tell us a little bit of why remembrance and you know collective narratives, how does art relate to that and how do you use art to do that work and to tell that story? Thanks. You are on mute, we can't hear you. Yes. Are we good? Yes, all good. Uh, I'm getting used to this thing. Um, <laughs> well, the so my work really is to 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 deal with the, the things that I I believe Africa as a continent hasn't dealt with appropriately. I believe there is a lot of injustice on the African continent because we move on easily. Often, many Africans and a lot of people in that room can testify that they learn about their history when they leave home. They learn about the issues of contention in their homes when they go to study abroad. Uh, I, I believe it's wrong, and we cannot move forward with our development agenda if we do not contend with the issues that have divided us in the past. When you go to Europe and America, you will find in many of the countries Holocaust museums and uh, even museums commemorating and remembering the effects of slavery and the slave trade. Africa went through a lot during colonialism and uh, post-colonial Africa also descended into many civil wars. But what we did was to simply end those wars and move on with our lives without dealing with the issues, the underlying issues that led to those conflicts. We signed peace accords and everyone goes home without dealing with the effects of those conflicts on human beings. Uh, and, and we all live with this chronic psychological trauma that limits our performance and development drive. But because those issues are psychological, they are not naturally discussed in development agenda. And, uh, and that is why I, I found that it was important to, to deal with these remnants of, of, of violence and injustice and human rights abuses in, in our societies. And because this work of memory and remembrance is basically a work of history, dealing with the past, understanding the past in order to move forward appropriately. That is why we have to use all forms of 
art to, to reach the people. Um, one of the things we are doing in Sierra Leone is a lot of film and video testimonies, uh, making sure that um, people are listening to one another through film and, and video and uh, also leading discussions and narratives from there. Uh, recently, because our work of mapping and protecting mass graves around Sierra Leone are in remote places where most Sierra Leoneans living in the urban areas cannot go, we recently had to organize a, a photo exhibition that dealt with issues of mass graves and their stories. Because our Truth and Reconciliation Commission said appropriately that Behind every mass grave is a tragic story. And we try to bring those tragic stories to the people through art, especially photo exhibitions and, um, and films, so that they can learn from one another and become aware of the issues that previously divided them in order to create a clean slate where they can uh, advance together as, as, as a country. Uh, we cannot pretend that our civil wars, our political insurrections, our tribal conflicts end when we sign peace treaties because there are issues that lead people to conflict and we have to keep dealing with those issues through uh, remembrance and, and memory. And we have not done that. I, I'm trying to talk about this in, in the African sense, generally, uh, beyond Sierra Leone, because many African countries have not done this. So there are these underlying contentions that every now and then we are afraid could lead to future violence. Two countries have led in this regard. Um, South Africa, most of my work, I learned through the work of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who led the South African Truth and Reconciliation process after apartheid, and also the work that Rwanda is doing to make sure that lessons from that genocide uh, is transmitted to the younger generation of the Rwandan people in order to create mechanisms to prevent these conflicts. Because as much as we may wish, we cannot develop uh, materially if we do not deal with the psychological limitations of our society, the underlying effects of conflicts on our people, generationally. Uh, there are, if you look at the Algerian War of Independence, for instance, there are people still alive who carry the burden of that conflict, which has not been dealt with appropriately. Uh, the Sierra Leonean Civil War ended 20 years ago. People who were child soldiers are still among us as young adults who did not undergo any form of counseling or therapy. Uh, they were simply told to return to society. I don't believe, no matter how hard we try, we can achieve development agenda, which we often talk about materially. People talk about roads and bridges and schools and hospitals. These are great. But when the people themselves are not well, and we haven't created open forum for collective healing, we cannot achieve these uh, development agenda. In fact, what it leads to is the general national malaise, which in my country, for instance, we are still um, witnessing. Often recently after an insurrection on August 10 this year, everybody now started talking about our Truth and Reconciliation Commission and why haven't we done a lot to implement its recommendations. But as soon as those emergencies end, everybody moves on without continuing that conversation, um, which is not good um, for the continent. And this is why I have undertaken this work of, uh, of making sure that we stop I used to think that um, Africans just don't understand the issues of memory, remembrance, and collective healing, until I realized that they are very much participating in collective healing as well. Uh, the African countries are part of the General Assembly where we make rules for Holocaust remembrance, 
just a few days ago, my own government participated in a launching of Poppy Day, where they're all wearing red poppies in remembrance of European conflicts. But when they come home, uh, then they all of a sudden don't want to confront the issues that underlie the development of their country. And, uh, and I believe if we do not do that, we cannot. We cannot honestly move forward um, in our development agenda. Uh, I don't like to go on and on and on, so I'll stop there. I, I usually like to answer specific questions. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Joseph. Um, there isn't much to add. I will open the floor um, in one minute to, the, to, to you for questions. But I would like to publicly um, recognize Sarah, who is assisting us with um, interpretation. Sarah is actually from Algeria. So pleased to have you, and thank you again. So we're going to go to the questions. Um, who is the first person? I see your hand. Thank you. Do you already have the microphone? Um, no? OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Williams. I'm a doctoral student here. Uh, and I want to appreciate all of the panelists. I have a very personal question for, uh, I think it's Dr. Joseph Kaifala. Uh, so here we have a course uh, entitled Violence, History and Memory in 20th Century Africa. It was on Thursday and it held yesterday. And this is the question I asked to the professor yesterday and I want to ask it to you also. I, I know that a lot of my colleagues are here who are students in this class. So I want to ask you, with your very everyday engagement with um, tragedy and trauma, how do you manage to stay sane and, <laughs> and sober, right? Yes, um, that, is, that is a fantastic question. I think another friend asked me that uh, a few months ago when I was uh, in DC, and the question, they put it quite simply, Joseph, who heals the healer? Um, I think uh, when one engage in this, in this work, uh, especially on the African continent in the Sierra Leonean sense, I just came back from the field yesterday, and you listen to stories and basically assume the emotional and traumatic burdens of other people. Um, there is no general prescription for how to deal with that as an individual. But what I have done is, first of all, a few years ago, I encountered uh, a Holocaust survivor. His name was uh, Victor Franco. Victor Franco wrote a book that is popular around the world and various others dealing with uh, trauma, the Holocaust survivor. But one of his best book is Man's Search for Meaning. And a phrase I got from that book was a quotation he actually got from Nietzsche. And it says, "Where if you have a why, you can survive anyhow. And I have let that principle define my life and in the way I deal with other people's trauma that I, I receive. To say, to find meaning in my own existence, uh, from various sectors of my life, through family, through friends, through the opportunities I have even to, to, to be alive, to sit and write. So that immediate reckoning with my own life helps me uh, essentially listen to other people and be able to offer them um, whatever I can offer, which oftentimes is merely uh, uh, listening ears uh, to to ensure that they can share their story with someone as um, is important. So that's essentially what I do um, to to find meaning in spite of everything. In fact, one of Victor Frankl's book is I think Life in Spite of Everything, um, and that helps me. It helps me a lot, and I also find it a privilege and an opportunity to be able to 
bring their stories to life, to offer them the forum to share their stories as a form of healing. Um, many of the traditional rite ceremonies that we support are part of this idea of collective healing. Uh, it is important to people to offer traditional burial rites to their dead. So facilitating that um, gives me a little bit of meaning because I see that I have offered an opportunity for a little, a little healing. You cannot really... Uh, the certain forms of atrocities you can't heal, but you can offer a little bit of solace. And, and, but you must also prepare yourself for, for what comes out of that. I am even also planning to, to study a little bit more formally uh, Victor Frankl's work because if I'm to continue to do this work, I need to be able to do exactly what you are asking to heal myself, uh, to be able to sleep at night half after hearing really personal, hurtful stories and not being able to, 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 to bring solution for that because there's, there are some sufferings we don't have solution to. We can only help people to find meaning in their suffering. Thank you. Do we have more questions? Okay, go ahead, please. Um, hello? Is it, oh, hello. Um, you guys have spoken a lot about your lived experience um, kind of existing in multiple countries at the same time. And so I wondered if you guys could speak about how the understanding of diaspora plays into your work and how you manage what diaspora constructs as well as deconstructs in terms of your identity and what you're able to produce from your identity. So, yes, you may go ahead. <laughs> um, that's a great question. And what's your name? Zora. Zora, yeah. Um, thanks for asking that question. That is a really important question. Um, I'm going to try and have a crack at it from my experience um, moving from different countries. Um, yes, it's, it's very difficult um, when you move from place to place um, because you're leaving something behind and you're going to an, the unknown and you don't know what to experience or what to expect. So when you get there sometimes, um, it's this thing where we call either you're disappointed or you're trying to figure out how you embrace this new environment. I think that's what it was for us. So when we, when, when we moved, well, one of my parents moved first. Um, and they, they moved to find a better life, right? Um, and then you have this dialogue with the one that's in the West to the one that lives stayed in Africa. So all of the whole family have this imaginary idea of this new place that they're going to. Um, because as, as myself, like if, if one is in Europe and another one is in Africa, you always look at the one in Europe as they in paradise. You're thinking that you're in this place where there's like still struggle. So that there becomes the breadwinner, there becomes the people that you look forward to. So when you move and join them to this new environment and everything changes because it becomes a reality. It's not, it's not this imaginary place that you have in your head. Um, and you get to that place and now you have to accustom to where you are and how you live and then connect your, your, your old life to this new life. It, it, it is difficult because you're always gonna be mirroring between like your Africans, well now you're in the West and the Western world is different to Africa. And I think you find your place as you go along because you're starting to find things that resonate with you, who you are. And you're starting to build community because you find people that probably either understand what you understand or speak your same language, but you're connecting together. Probably they from a completely different part of the world, but you just have something a little bit in common and then you build from that. So with me, my experience was that, finding new friends, finding a new environment, and starting to find things that are common around me, and learning from it, and then realize 
there's a lot to, there's a lot to learn. Um, and I, I quickly realized that knowledge is also key. It's like, if you, if you equip yourself with knowledge, it, the world becomes your oyster. You can go wherever you want to go and connect to wherever and, and be able to live in harmony because you understand and respect each and everyone's culture. Um, how I navigate within the diaspora is always look at, we're fortunate to be in the West and then other people are not fortunate. They're in, in probably in Africa, in poverty or, or whatever. How we translate what we know now to what we know back to meet with them and their expectation is always something that I find fascinating. Like having little discussion with people and finding out their idea about culture, about art, to your idea. It's like we navigate it and talk about it and learn so much and then be able to actually pass on those knowledge to other people. I think your, with your question, it, it, it is difficult to be honest, like as a diaspora, because we're always looking at us in a different perspective. Because we're here, we're all saying we are one, right? But the moment you touch back to Africa sometimes, if you don't speak the language, people or the kids there probably don't look at you as one of them. So you find yourself in this in this pretty comment where you feel lost. You're like, but I rep this continent. I love this place. But when you're there now, and then everyone thinking, oh, you're not, you don't understand the struggles here. But with us as a diaspora, we're here, but when we go back there, we tend to forget that that's where we're from. And we automatically start to put on what we've learned from the West and then change completely. And I think that doesn't help our perspective as a diaspora because I think that's what we struggle with. Because we're, 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 we're forgetting we're in between these this two places. But fundamentally, you just we just got to understand that we're the same people and got to understand where they're coming from and where they are. And sometimes they don't have the opportunities that we're, we're open to. So how do we share those like kind of knowledge with each other to be able to help us grow? And for me, I've been banking myself in trying to like help everyone I connected with also in Sierra Leone to just get, take this idea off the head that they need to be in the West to be able to make it in life. And I'm saying, no, you don't have to. Where you are, you've got a lot of inspiration around you that you can build from. So let's just, this. that's why I set up this, this thing now through the mayor dialogue, which creatives from Sierra Leone are coming to London and work with creatives and, that, and the diaspora in, in London. They share ideas. So they'll do the same thing. The creatives from London will go back to Sierra Leone so they can have that dialogue of like talking about the spaces that they are and what they're doing, how they both can help each other share those knowledge. So I don't know if that can answer your question, but maybe you might have something to add to it. Yeah, I'll definitely add to it, and uh, I think it's a, a great question. For me, identity is uh, layered, and when you're in the diaspora, you really feel these different layers, and uh, your, but your social identity shifts uh, depending on the environment in which you are. So you can be perceived uh, as African in a certain place, as non-African in a certain place, as African enough, not African enough. Um, and uh, I think this is why my work is around researching and knowledge of self as well. It's uh, just like peeling the layers beyond the social identity that is, that is the interface with which we interact with our environment. And uh, for me, it's extremely dynamic. And we put on different, our identities are constructed in function of our environment, and we put on different um, also characteristics, we act also differently, we dress differently, depending on uh, where we are, is it at work, is it at, and this is for everyone. 
uh, it's not just linked with uh, being African. So it's, for me, my work um, has been around really, um, yeah, making sure that people I engage with understand where uh, I am situated and uh, what my voice, where my voice is coming from. And it's, it's based on my history and what I've gone through. And it's not based on a hypothetical identity. Merci pour la question. C'est très, c'est très, c'est une très belle question, j'avoue. Et moi, me concernant, en tant qu'artiste euh, contemporain, as a contemporary artist, euh, généralement chez nous euh, en Afrique, c'est toujours compliqué de d'avoir du succès tant que ton travail n'est pas exposé à l'extérieur, en Occident, par exemple. As an African, it's very hard to give tribute to your work and have success if your work is not actually showcased in Europe or elsewhere. Mais moi, ça n'a pas été mon cas parce que ma mission c'était de de faire aimer là mon art par les habitants de mon pays. But that was not my mission because my first goal was actually to make the people of my country love love art and my art. Donc c'était c'était plus facile pour moi le jour que j'ai j'ai franchi le territoire occidental avec mon travail parce que mon travail parlait de mon pays, de là où je viens. When I came to the Western world with my work. Et donc du coup, c'est c'était nouveau déjà pour les pour les occidentaux de voir euh, l'Afrique à travers une œuvre d'art, à travers des couleurs, des belles couleurs, ça faisait rêver. C'est pas l'Afrique qu'on montre souvent euh, avec des enfants, avec des peaux qui sont dans la rue avec des gros ventes mal formés qui ont faim. Mais c'est c'est vraiment l'Afrique qui fait rêver à travers mon boulot. My goal is actually to showcase another Africa, an Africa of colors and beauty, and not the Africa that is usually depicted. Sinon, la question c'est vraiment une vraie question parce que il y a il y a beaucoup d'artistes qui ont qui qui sont confrontés à à des situations où on ne considère pas leurs travaux quand ils arrivent avec ici parce qu'on ne comprend pas, on se demande. De quoi il parle, lui, son art, c'est, on ne connaît pas, c'est, c'est nouveau pour nous. A lot of artists from Africa, when they come here, they struggle to actually make people understand their work and people don't get what they do. Alors que la majorité de beaucoup de mouvements qui existent en Occident ont la base pour l'art africain, ont pour base l'art africain. Whereas when we look at art and most of the art in Europe, the, its origins usually, most of the time, comes from Africa. Mais je, souvent, je trouve ça un peu aussi choquant de 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 penser que on a vraiment besoin de d'un regard extérieur pour pour dire que ceci c'est de là ou ou euh, ça c'est pas de là. Je je trouve ça dommage au fait. Ouais. It saddens me, and I find it sometimes shocking to need this external approval which would decide what art is and what art is not. Euh, pour finir, je dirais, l'art africain, bon, aujourd'hui, on n'utilise même plus le terme art africain, on dit, tout, on dit tout simplement art contemporain, parce que dans tous les grands musées, dans toutes les grandes foires, les grosses ventes aux enchères aujourd'hui, c'est l'art africain, donc, bon, pas l'art africain, l'art contemporain, donc, c'est des artistes qui viennent de l'Afrique, C'est le travail qui, qui vient de l'Afrique qui est proposé dans, dans ce genre d'endroit. Donc, on ne doit plus utiliser le thème art africain. On doit dire juste art contemporain parce que c'est de là. Et il n'y a pas de frontières. Tout le monde se ressent dedans, que tu sois euh, de l'Occident ou de l'Asie. Mais tu, tu comprends, tu arrives à t'imprégner. Et ça, ça, l'histoire que les artistes racontent aussi peut te toucher, même si tu n'as jamais été en Afrique. Donc, on ne doit plus utiliser ce mot. I believe we should not use the word African art because when we look at contemporary art, it's most of the time again from Africa. Non, c'est tout. C'était juste la petite parenthèse. Merci. Thank you.
Um, do we have maybe one or two final questions? Okay, I see four. How are we, Abdu? I think we could only just do one, but the panelists, they would be open to speaking with you afterwards, so you could please feel free to approach, you know, somebody who you'd like to direct your question to. So who is the one going to be? Let's see. I have the mic, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> microphone privileges, thank you. Um, Thank you so much for the presentation and all that you guys have said. Um, my question is to, I think, Dr. Kaifala. Um, I'm from a country who has gone through 20 years of dictatorship. We're currently also doing the, actually we've done the commissions, we're doing the, currently doing the memorizations, the memo, all that jazz that the TRCs and all that. But at what point do we say we've achieved remembrance? Um, all these people who have gone through the torture and all of that, we have at this point look at it, okay, and say, we have achieved this, it's enough now, let's move on. Uh, that's a good question. I guess that's even those who deal with this whole concept of transitional justice have been discussing. Uh, but the importance about uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is that primarily, especially in terms of Sierra Leone, for instance, it was mandated to create an impartial historical record of the Sierra Leonean Civil War, which it did very well, provided clear history of where we were, how we came along, and how we went into conflict, which is what any good Truth and Reconciliation Commission should do. Secondly, a proffered recommendations. So now you know how you got here. These are the things you could do to create a better future. And, and, and those are the areas that many post-conflict societies have problems with. Uh, Sierra Leone has not done very well in implementing the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I don't know how far your country has done, but that is the beginning of the work after truth and reconciliation. And then all I can say is history never ends. Um, countries are built from generation to generation and each generation needs to know where it comes from, um, the foundations of its existence and not only the good stuff. In Sierra Leone, uh, many of the Sierra Leoneans in that room can attest that we love good history, and, and in, in many places we love to celebrate our history, our uh, our uh, our heroes. You go to any African country or, or any country for that matter, you will quickly through monuments in the streets, streets names, hear about its heroes. Uh, you come to Sierra Leone, you will hear of Baibure, Liberia. You will hear of uh, other people. Even now in contemporary society, you hear of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf being the first female uh, president, and uh, you will hear of the Kenyans in Kenya. In South Africa, you will hear of Mandela, Oliver Tambo, and others. That shouldn't be the end of history, because that is not how life works. We live in a life, we live lives of happiness and sadness. And these sad moments are also part of our collective history that we can learn from. I refrain from using that. If you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it because it's too absolute. Some history is important to repeat. You know, if you've done good things in the past, there's nothing wrong with repeating them, right? Um, but we must discuss where we went wrong so that we can avoid those mistakes in the future. And in that regard, I believe there's always work to be done with the past. We must learn from it. We must teach the next generation um, to guide them into their future, even as we learn from our own experiences. Um, so that's, that's how I see it. But the most important thing after violent conflicts is really the work of the TRC and how best we implement its recommendations. Uh, Desmond Tutu, before he died, was quite disappointed with the way South Africa, for instance, was implementing uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations. So there's always work to be done. And we must embrace it as part of our life, as part of our existence, not something we have to do just because it's 
a commission. Um, and 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 I, in this country, as a historian myself, I always tell people. We are losing you a bit, Joseph. We somehow can't hear you. Joseph? I am not sure what's really going on, but we can't hear you. We didn't hear the last two sentences you said. Are you back? Hey, I'm right here. It told me your okay. <laughs> fabric has died or something. <laughs> yeah, we missed the last sentence that you said. Um... Oh, the, uh, the last sentence. What was the last sentence? That, that um, uh, the... The story of the Sierra Leonean Civil War is part of the history of Sierra Leone, and history must be told in its fullness, not just the part that we find heroic and happy for the nation. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that's a good note on which to end. Um, thank you to the audience. You were quite engaged um, throughout the session. Thank you so much. Deepest of appreciation to our panelists. Um, you raised a lot of you know, key points, some of which I'm sure resonated a lot with us here, the points of identity. Many of us who are in between different places, so we can relate to that to a great extent. And um, the violence history and memory course, some of us, we've taken, it, taken that course and we leave with a question like, does this ever end? And actually, my, a question that I wanted to ask the panel was, does this work ever get does it ever get tiring? Because it's all, a lot of it is about reappropriating, creating narratives, and there's a lot of dedication to that. To that, but we can see from what you said, you know, your dedication, your commitment, and the drive. And so we know you never attain um, um, memory or remembrance. You know, it, it continues. So the work continues. And to close, I just want to say again, thank you so much. Um, do enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Photo, please. Thank you. I'll just Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you again to the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 So I'm inviting the moderator, I'm inviting Jasmine, but also Zaninka, who will be joined by, Fode, by uh, Steven Yebo online. And this will be just a spotlight on some of the African alumni that have been doing a lot of work in their respective field. Thank you so much. Thank you. I clearly have a fan in the back who just started the clapping. <laughs> I'll wait for Zanika to come up. Is Stephen online? By any chance? Okay. Thing are you on? Sure, I'll ask you after. I'll ask you after. Cool. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fireside Chat, um, where we'll be highlighting two alumni stories. My name is Jasmine Pakua, a PhD student here, and I'll be your moderator for this session. So the structure will be as follows, as you've probably seen in the other sessions. Um, I will introduce our panelists, and after they have spoken, we'll have a Q&A, and I'll open the floor up for you to interrogate them a little bit. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Seneca Intagungera. I practiced this so hard. Um, who supports the transversal projects and partnerships at the Climate Action Accelerator and is leading the development 
of the Support Programme for National Actors. Her previous experiences include being a researcher on the Youth and Permaculture Project in Guinea with the International Trade Centre, as well as her collaborations with the Rwanda Environment Management Authority on research on the history of plastics in the country, so Rwanda. She holds a master's degree in development here, and she specialised in environment and sustainability. We are also joined online by Stephen Yabo, who has more than 10 years of experience in research and policy, policy analysis on Africa's extractive sector. He is the co-founder and CEO of Commodity Monitor, which is a trading, logistics, and research company that provides contributions to sustainable production, supply, and consumption of African commodities. These include agriculture, mining, oil, and gas. Commodity Trainer is also a leading, leading the deployment of improved technology in the artisanal small-scale mining companies in Ghana. And Stephen has, wears many hats. He is also the CEO of Stemma Resources Limited, a junior mining company based in Accra, Ghana. So before you begin talking to the both of you, I wanted to ask what were some of your motivations for taking your careers in the path that you have? I can start with you, Zanny, and then we'll go to Stephen. Oh, yes, okay. Uh, my motivations for taking my career. Um, before I came to the institute, because I did my bachelor's in political science and I was generally interested in, in politics and in understanding how the things I saw in my life made sense and how, and what, I think what, the way, the th I think, for example, I'm the kind of person who's driving down the road in somewhere and I'm wondering how the road got there or like how roads function and like who's in charge of this, like who brought the road here. So I was like, okay, I'm interested, I think, in how governments work, how countries function. And before it was really broad, I was like, okay, maybe human rights, maybe gender, maybe really anything that's politically charged. And then I lived in Guinea with my family for a few years. And I remember moving there and looking outside my window and, uh, and seeing how much plastic was everywhere. Being from Rwanda, you see very, 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 very much less plastic. So I think that shocked me, the difference, the contrast. And not just plastic, like you can live with plastic and it could be fine, but really just how people lived with it, interacted with it, how beaches, instead of having sand, really had plastic. But I really, I really mean that. I hope, uh, I don't know if anyone here is from Guinea or has been there, but and how um, it's burning and how in countries like Guinea, there's high levels of respiratory diseases and asthma because of how people are living with a material that was never meant to arrive in this place. And now we find ourselves in a situation where um, we don't really control how we interact with this material. And I think that opened my eyes uh, to environmental issues in general. And really from there it, it escalated and, and I find myself here and it went from plastic to everything else that's climate related, environmentally related. But I think my moving to Guinea was that. And I think if I hadn't moved there, I probably wouldn't be here. I would say that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Thank you. Stephen. All right, thanks Yasmin. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so basically, I, I did also my bachelor's in Ghana, and I grew up in a typical mining community called Oboase. So Oboase in Ghana here hosts um, one of the oldest mines um, operated by Anglo a South African uh, uh, multinational. So um, growing up, I saw that actually there are two groups of miners in Ghana, the large scale miners and small scale miners. So you could see that the large scale miners are a bit very organized and then the small scale miners are not organized so quite operating informally and that leads to a lot of things so they they pollute the environment they expose themselves to toxic chemicals including mercury and cyanide so basically this underpinned my research so i've been focusing more on natural resources and you know that actually led me to uh, the garden institute in geneva uh, where I completed the MBA in Development Studies in 2012, and it's been um, in 2014 rather. It's it's been uh, I think um, um, a bit of a journey, uh, actually a useful one indeed because I I got all the training I needed. So basically, you know, why commodities? You know, so I found Commodity Monitor, for example, in um, in 2017, and the motivation was actually Geneva. 
like through her studying, you know, at the Grad Institute. I followed up on commodity trading companies, you know, and a lot of them operating, you know, uh, along the along the lake. So that got me motivated. And of course, the story about the commodity sector, natural resource sector in the continent, you know, uh, it raises a lot of sometimes, you know, heart wrenching uh, emotions, basically because you have you know, let's say coltan in DLC, you have gold in Ghana, oil in Nigeria, diamond in let's say Botswana or Namibia. But a few of the success stories can be can be told when these natural resources are mentioned. So Commodity Monitor was to come in basically to see if we can connect the dots, actually to connect the trainer and then create the value chain that's needed to make sure the continent is able to harness the potential that it has uh, with regards to the resource potential uh, within this continent. So that's basically the, how the journey has been. But I think it's quite exciting that, you know, let's say that the so-called natural resource case many years ago, uh, that was touted, of course, in the various academic literature, in the media. Uh, today, a lot has changed from my experience. You know? So I, right after the Gallery Institute, I worked with the Africa Progress Panel, which was chaired by the late um, and former actually uh, alumnus, Kofi Annan. And then I proceeded to the African Development Bank. So all this tra the, the trajectory had been following um, uh, the natural resource chain. And I think this is vital because uh, if the continent is to transform, almost every African country, you know, possess some resource. And until those resources are developed and transformed, definitely we will have, you know, some hitches when it comes to its development potential. And this is basically what I think, you know, could be done, that most of the discussions should be centered on harnessing um, the value chain of natural, each of the natural resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just thought maybe um, just to follow up on that, how can you see the continent then harnessing some of this material? Because you said that the potential for the continent to harness this material, but how do you practically see the continent harnessing it? Uh, yeah, quite a good question. Um, it is still a long way. And basically, um, there is a political element and there is an economic element. The economic element is, has widely been discussed, right? It then comes down to the political element, right? We all know the importance of, let's say, uh, coal town now in the whole development of, of, uh, of electric vehicles, you know, the battery revolution and all that. So how then would the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, harness, you know, this resource? It's basically that it has to transform the value chain so that if the coal town is extracted in, in Congo, it shouldn't land in, in Brussels or it shouldn't land in, in Switzerland before it comes back into the continent. It means that the whole value chain when it comes to, you know, coal town development has to happen within uh, uh, Congo or at least within the, the African region. I think this is where it comes in that, but basically you need a very strong political leadership. And political leadership, you're talking about people with their will and then with their fortitude to push for the decision that, it's, 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 it shouldn't no more be cocoa, right? Cocoa beans living the shores of Cote d'Ivoire or living the shores of Ghana and, and having to come to Cote, uh, Geneva or Switzerland or having to come to London, right? Or to the US. Basically that the, the whole cocoa beans has to be processed right in the continent and then at least uh, sent to Europe. I think that will generate some vital you know, value chain economic activities. I think this is what is missing, but if we should be able to have a very fine, uh, connect, you know, connecting trade, right, between the economics and the politics of each of these resources. And I think this is where it's lacking. Sometimes the economics, we get it right, but the politics has to be, you know, has to be, you know, uh, position well. Otherwise, this will, dev it will never work. Thank you, Stephen. I wanted to come back um, to you, Zani. You said you work in climate action. And a lot of the rhetoric, we were having a discussion earlier, a lot of the rhetoric is that um, Africa should not really be involved in climate action because they've not caused most of the problem. So then why do they have to do the work? What do you say to that? Um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's, I, I yeah. <laughs> Everyone has really strong feelings about that. I think you're probably laughing because maybe uh, on the other side, because I think I have a different opinion on that. And I think, I think my opinion is also really based on 
everyone's positionality and what your position is. Because, for example, um, I'll meet people in Geneva, like Africans in Geneva, who are living a Geneva life, let's say, and who will have arguments, let's say, this is, this is a really short example, and it's not even about climate action, I'll come back to that a bit later, like about vegetarianism and how it's a, it's a, it's a privilege. And, 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 as, and giving a contrast that Africans, certain Africans don't have the privilege to be vegetarian, and there's no one that can have an argument against that. But I find it really interesting when those people bring that argument in this context, because in this context, if you wanted to make the choice towards vegetarianism for climate reasons, health reasons, the same argument you're using for the pastoralist in Chad is not the argument you can use now, it's different. So I think when people talk about climate action and the different things different people can do in different situations, I think using the idea that just because we didn't contribute to the problem, we shouldn't contribute to the solution is super simplistic, especially when you reach in positions or in, uh, in places where you can do something, and no one is, I'm, I, no one is disagreeing with the fact that there's players who can do much more, who should do much more, and who are being encouraged to do much more, and then there's players who do what they can, however they can. I think, let me just, speaking on the NGO I work for and the partners we work for, which really the focus is helping humanitarian organizations that want to decarbonize their operations to do so. And um, our pilot partner was Alima. Alima is a Dakar-based humanitarian agency. I really did not know it before, which is such a shame because honestly, if anyone is kind of interested in humanitarianism but took a humanitarianism class and is feeling a bit shady about it, but really was always interested in that and wants to see like what a different type of humanitarianism is in an African way, doing it locally, I really encourage you to look at Alima, because I really wish I knew about that organization before. That was a pilot, that was our pilot partner. They said, we'll join, we'll decrease our footprint. We're based in Dakar. We work directly with local NGOs in every country that we're in, but we see the impact of climate change on the communities we serve, the places we live, our partners see it. We see the correlation between health and climate, the way, um, so many diseases are linked to the way um, rainfall patterns change, the way climate change, and saying we're doing it, our partners are doing it, we see the way hospitals are more resilient if you increase and mix your um, local grid generators with solar panels because we, we're in an energy crisis, we're in a food crisis, they see those links, and I, that's why I think it's super simplistic sometimes when there's almost a refusal to participate, I think, in climate action because I think it's a bit trendy, not trendy, but like it's, what's it called? It's powerful to stand your ground and say, I didn't do this, don't make me change. But then I think it's maybe simplistic because, in, because we're all going to suffer the consequences and are. So uh, there's a difference in saying, okay, I see what needs to be done and I'll do some of it and I'll ask you and I'll, I will not force you because we really don't have much power to force, but I will request of you and, and like we're doing and how financing is going and is playing and needs to play a major, major role. But I just think it's really, I find it super simplistic sometimes when there's a bit of a refusal and a very simplistic refusal. Um, when, at least from what I see in, from Alima and other organizations and other really small national actors that are doing so, so much in agriculture, in, in so many other things to, to be more resilient climate-wise on their own. Um, so I, I've just, I've seen enough to stay encouraged that it's not a general refusal, but that it's a refusal maybe based on what feels possible, which is fair because a lot of things don't feel possible. Um, but also I think it's content and the content that we see and the things that we hear and the perspectives and where they come from and who is speaking, I really think that's so important because there's a lot of people who've heard the climate crisis, the climate narrative from very specific, I was gonna say looking people, from, from Europeans or from, or from voices that do not sound like they're talking about you and your problem and I think that influences how you receive that information and I think that's been probably the biggest, um, um, what's it called, what word am I looking for? 
my brain has had to switch to English today. Um, like, a, um, uh, anyways, like the barrier to letting Africans internalize and 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 like imagine what climate lo action looks like, and how um, it's not even necessarily Western or has to be. And anyways, I think there's just a lot of things that have created such a major barrier and made the refusal almost feel independent. Like we're being independent and expressing our independence by refusing, but it's blocking us because the problem isn't going anywhere. So your refusal will be also um, not the end of you. That's very dramatic, but the problem is still there. So we have to imagine. I think imagination is also really part of it and finding which I think narrative is so important, and I think the panel before was super interesting, but everything is really about retelling the story in, with, with what you see and, and the kinds of people who are telling those stories. Um, yes, I don't know if I answered the question. I think you did to a large extent. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna open this up without hogging the conversation, so if you have any questions, please feel free to put your hands up. I see one over there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Theo, first year Mint student. Um, concerning like climate change, um, my view on Africa um, isn't necessarily we shouldn't contribute, but it's more of a question of can we ever contribute to the point that it will solve anything? Because we have these few multinationals that are contributing to the grunt of you know the fossil fuels that are harmful. Like I think they contribute the most to it. And so, yes, I do think, I do agree with you on the point that like um, sometimes we use this as an excuse not to do anything whilst we should, we should be. Because like, for example, I'm from Nigeria, one third of you know, my country is under flood right now. And it's a, it's a growing concern. We've always said this, that climate change will affect, you know, the global south the most, you know, countries are going underwater. But I think the issue for me is, you know, there's so much pressure, for example, the people look at Africa and say, you should be doing something. They look at the global south, you guys should be doing something. And I feel like it's like a deflecting. It's like how they told us to use plastic. I mean, was it, it's not plastic straws, but um, paper straws instead. You know, and that doesn't really solve anything. You know, I, I don't think, you know, I, I think even if we want to go completely green in Africa, we wouldn't scratch the surface of the issue. So. I mean, I would love to hear your opinions on that. Yeah, um, that's, that's fair. And I think maybe there's a, um, there's a belief, I think, in, in climate action that, and I think like the concept of like, oh, but my action is just a small drop in the water. And I think if, the only actions we did were those that had major impact. I think most of us wouldn't would really do much because most of the things we do in our, most people, I don't know, maybe some people here have major, major, major power, but most of us don't do things that have like really large impacts when we see them. And I think the examples that you gave, and at least what I've seen is in the place that you live, in the communities that you live and the impacts that you see, it's what you do to make it so that you survive the next week and the next year and that you protect your people and that you, and that you try to develop or try to grow or try to keep going with your life, but in a way in which you're at least protecting yourself from the next one. And most of the time, that's not going to reduce the tons of CO2 that are in the atmosphere today. That action is being pushed to other people. And those who are doing it to deflect, then ignore them because then you're deflecting and we can hear it. So I think there's a difference between those that need to stop emitting um, CO2 into the atmosphere, there's a, the, like the multinationals, countries that are emitting a lot, that's one thing and they have the message and the message is stop and that message will continue and the pressure is there, will they, will they not, we, we keep going. But then um, the, the emissions that Africa does not emit or tries not to emit by switching the way we do things is not so that we can reduce the emissions globally, even though that is the case. Because if Africa, when people predict how much um, emissions in the next 
I don't know, 50 years, there's going to be switches. If Africa keeps growing, we will start emitting more. And the, the way, in, especially like Europe's emissions are reducing and countries that are under pressure will reduce their emissions and those that are not trying to develop in different ways, emissions will increase. But that's still like in, in, in the next multiple decades. So I think it's, 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 if the question is about, I will only act if my impact is large, I think wouldn't apply to multiple people and multiple things. We don't apply that logic to a lot of the things that we do in our daily lives. So I think it's really just about um, doing the things that are useful now and that will be useful later, but the priority is how to make sure that, again, like we protect ourselves from flood and what is the things that can actually, one, mitigate that, but also adapt us to that. So I, I, think, I think impact should not um, prevent us from acting. Um, but it's hard, it's hard and, and yeah, it's really hard. Yeah. I get it, yeah. Okay, do we have any other questions? No? Okay, I'm gonna take this opportunity to ask Stephen another question. So we have, um, you mentioned before that so many people are always talking about how Africa is mismanaging its resources, et cetera. And we also have so many opinions about people within the con um, continent and also outside of the continent making discussions, having discussions about whether resource management, appropriate resource management will save the continent. What are your views on um, resource management in terms of it being the savior of the continent? And do you foresee other ways in which we could I hate the term develop because I think every country is developing, um, but in terms of how we could develop the continent. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me first you know, sh you know, shine some light on the climate uh, discourse. Uh, yes, I actually worked at the, the energy complex of the African Development Bank, you know, but I held personally one uh, I belief that I think the whole climate discourse is, is of course, is a buzzword and is becoming trendy to the disadvantage of African countries. So the outcome of going carbon free, or let's say pursuing the green pathway is development and prosperity, right? But this is a case where several African countries, for example, if you look at electricity, almost entirely, even South Africa today is experiencing extreme you know, issues uh, when it comes to all shortage, when it comes to electricity. So the continent or most of the African countries are extremely energy poor. So what is it that you are pushing a climate narrative, right, at the disadvantage of energy? Let me give you an, an example. Gas, right? Today, of course, you know, uh, uh, Europe is heading towards the winter, right? And today, gas is critical, especially with the whole Russian, Ukraine, you know, uh, uh, um, debacle and all that. But this is the case that when it comes to gas discourse in the, in the continent, it is, it, gas is termed, though it's a transition fuel, it's regarded as a dirty fuel. But to me, if you look at Mozambique or South Africa or even Nigeria, if gas is to be harnessed, you know, into, into uh, you know, in, uh, and, and made as an electricity, you know, a source of electricity for, for most of the people without access, I mean, for me, it would be one of, you know, um, a, a very wise decision. So this is where it comes then to the whole narrative. What then do we push? Of course, it's development. It's, of course, it's, it's transformation. But it should be development and transformation, uh, transformation first before you think about, oh, are we going carbon free? Are you going dirty or are we going clean? For me, as a country advances, you know, the various pathway is that as you advance, you become efficient as you move along. But this is the case that most of the African countries, though they have these fossil fuels for, for transformation, are being stopped in their tracks because of the whole climate in, you know, narratives being pushed around. So yes, I'm not you know, advocating for countries to go polluting, but I'm also against you know, narrative and discourse that Africans should hold their natural resources and then, and then wait until a clean, effective way is developed. If Nigeria has oil and gas, and if it can use that to, uh, to, to, to electrify itself, why not? If it can do so, I think this is where we need to. It's a bit of, we have to go against the grain and make sure we talk about the there's various needs, the specific needs, of, of, of African countries. And on, the, on your question, Yasmin, when it comes to 
the, the whole natural resource discourse. Yes, it's about management, it's about you know making use. But what really is missing is that we have to um, actually delineate the key issue when it comes to value chain or value addition. What constitutes value addition? It's just simple, is that if it's oil, if it's gas, or if it's uh, any mineral like diamond or gold or, or coltan, let us develop the chain within from extraction to processing to linking it to the industry that has to be done. I think this is, is one of the most you know, critical things when it comes to economic transformation. That's why you have you know, Ghana, for example, which used to be the largest gold producer, you know, working along with South Africa. But Ghana actually struggles when it comes to uh, economic transformation because all the raw gold actually ends up in either Dubai, right, for small scale miners, or in London for big scale miners. So, in a way, what you know, you would take for us to add a value to this resource. And of course, value, you know, in economics, value has to be associated with um, with uh, uh, um, demand, right? So, if you are uh, developing the value chain of this resource, it means that the demand has to be there, and it means that Africa has to shift away from. Um, um, uh, uh, I think it's more of like trying to push for a mining induced development or let's say natural resource induced development. The agricultural sector, let's say in the Saharan region, uh, let's say in Chad or Niger, the agricultural sector can develop if you're able to retain some amount of income or some amount of rent from the natural resource and reinvesting it into the agricultural sector. So I think this is the advantage is that natural resources generate a lot of um, a huge uh, resources within a short time. These resources have to be used to develop other productive economic sectors like agriculture, the commerce, the service sector. This is actually what the continent uh, hasn't been able to do so far. It's how we can actually kill the enclave uh, uh, characteristics that is attached to the natural resource sector. Thank you, Stephen. And I guess that alarm was trying to tell me to stop. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to give you, Zani, an opportunity to respond to the first part of his question, because I also get this a lot. Africa has not had an opportunity to actually use its resources, whereas the Western world has used all of the oil and gas to develop their own countries. So I wanted to give you this opportunity to respond to what Stephen has said. <laughs> Um, I think that's why, even when you asked your question, I said it's hard. And I think, again, bringing it back at least to the work that we do when we work with organizations, we always say, especially when you're a humanitarian organization, we always say, if it comes into question your social mission, then it doesn't make any sense. Because I think there isn't, it's not that Africa should not develop, and I agree with you, the word developing that enters a whole different conversation. That Africa shouldn't grow, that Africa shouldn't be able to grow in the same way the West has. I think for me, it becomes a question of, um, that sentence has been said many times, we still find ourselves in this situation where if we were to replicate the same um, trajectory as the West, we wouldn't get anywhere. So if we are to imagine a different way to grow, which combines natural resources and renewable resources and other things and follow the way structure effects change and that, I don't know, battery systems get better and, and in the West they develop other things and in Africa we develop other things. I think we just need to become, I just think we just have to imagine a different type of growth where we don't have to replicate what the West has done because this is where we are today. Because if we were to, then we could just forget climate action in general and go to bed and say we, we, I, we give up, but we're just gonna develop the way they have developed, and then, then what? Then Nigeria will keep flooding, and then, then, then really for me, okay, well, I'm getting excited. <laughs> for me, then, then what, you know? If the argument is we still need to grow, I, we agree, no one disagrees with that. We are energy poor, we are, I, I completely agree with you, South Africa will be claimed as whatever most developed country in Africa, low shedding every day. It makes no sense, but they've still given them that title. So if we're saying that, let's say, Rwanda wants to be as developed as South Africa, but then we get low shedding, it's just really reimagining the way we define things, the way we define growth, the way we define development, and what that looks like, and what energy is, and where we get it, and how we power. It, it's just reimagining, because I think it becomes very simple when we reuse the same sentences of, but we want to grow in the same way they did. And the question is, really, do we, 
you know what I mean? And it's just, and I really am not, it's not to say that Africa shouldn't grow, that makes no sense. It, it's really not the point, it's just how do we do that? And we're able, to imagine, we're able to imagine that we've skipped other things. We skipped landlines and we went to mobile phones. We can skip other things, you know what I mean? And it's just imagining that. It's just being able to imagine that and refusing the simplicity of that's how they did it, that's how we're gonna do it. Especially when we're in a crisis, we have to meet that challenge. It's, it's, for me, it's really just that. It's not disagreeing with growth, or even though if we want to disagree with growth, I could, but it's, <laughs> that's not. So it's, it's just that. Thank you, Zani. I see um, Stephen was writing quite fast. Um, I'll give you one minute to respond. One. Hey, oh, no. You're unmuted. Yes, yes. I think it is basically yes, it's about economic transformation. And if it's economic transformation, right, there are different pathways, whether following the advanced countries pathway or any other pathway, is that we shouldn't basically restrict uh, in a way uh, the development of these uh, resources, whether renewable or non-renewable, because at the end of it, you still have over 80% of, you know, Malians or Nigerians, or Chad, you know, Chadians actually lacking access to electricity. And electricity is everything. So let's say you want to advance industries in, in, in Mali, right? And you propose a solar, a solar, you know, revolution. Yes, yeah, solar is perfect. You can, it can power, you know, uh, households and others. But can solar actually power, you know, most of these, you know, uh, high-end, you know, in that industries? I think this is where, you know, it gets a bit controversial, is that, you know, yes, we can combine the real energy mixes and others, but it shouldn't be uh, that, that restrictive. And today, you know, most of the, you know, climate-driven policies, you know, you can read about all the energy policies. There is a gradual de-investment when it comes to the fossil fuel. Meanwhile, fossil fuel is highly still being used in the advanced countries, you know. So it's basically this controversy where I think that there is some piece of, it's a, I think, of course, it's, it's not a blame game, but it's basically that African government, African leaders to take matters into their own hands. If, 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 um, if oil and gas will help Nigeria, they should push and they make a case because you can develop gas as a clean energy. If it's, it's, it's diamond, that will help you. Just push for it. It was at the end of it, it's about you and having to power yourself, electrify yourself to support you know, industrial development. I think at the core, you're both almost saying the same thing in terms of finding ways that we could do things that is not the same <laughs> as the West. So I'm going to leave it on this note because he just stood up. <laughs> now, that means we're getting kicked off the stage. So thank you very much. And I would just like to give the panelists a round of applause. <laughs>
excellent support and who also sent um, a lot of the representative here today uh, also allowed us to have one of the awardees come in here, uh, Marie Chantal, and participate in this panel, and also the vision asset management. I would also like to thank all of the speakers and panelists, uh, Pamela, again, coming from all the way from Uganda, but then also extending her stay. We have Fode, we have Benazir Aminata, we have Obu who flew all the way from Abidjan. We really would like to thank you again. Um, I would like to thank the Geneva Graduate Institute community. Uh, we've also had support from the communication department, also the events department. Special thanks to Sabrina, who was here also all the way. Um, for this past month, she's been really busy um, helping us, so thank you again. And finally, the organizing committee of the, of the summit. I think they have put a lot of work into making this happen. Um, some people have been contributing from Washington, some people from Bangkok, some people contributed from Dakar, Freetown. So everybody has really come together and then put efforts in making this a reality. Once again, the purpose of this summit, and I think we've succeeded in that, was to put forth some of the positive things that have been happening on the continent um, and to kind of fight this image that has been assigned to the continent. And so thank you so much again for all the African excellence that you have brought today to this stage, uh, to this institute, and then hopefully you're gonna inspire more people. I would like to give the floor rapidly to the co-director, Bassi Toure, who actually has a message uh, that he's sending us from uh, all the way from Freetown, Sierra Leone. <laughs> Hello Graduate Institute community, invited guests, all protocols observed. Greetings from Freetown, Sierra Leone on the west coast of Africa. My name is Pasti Bodeva Ture, co-director of this inaugural Geneva Summit on Africa. It gives me so much joy to see this summit successfully staged. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here today. Throughout the summit, we have showcased African excellence and spotlighted the innovative work led by Africans on the continent and in the diaspora. We have learned of the innovative work led by young Africans in particular, from improved healthcare delivery to embracing technology and governance. We've also gained insights on the unique role of the creative arts in redefining development for African people. We're sure that you leave here today with much inspiration and renewed hope to lead change here on the African continent and in the diaspora. Thank you very much and see you at the next edition of the Geneva Summit on Africa. The, sponsor, the cocktail that we're having sponsored by the IFPMA. So please, you can head back to the lunch spot and uh, I hope we see you next year. Thank you so much. Bye.